All right, thank you for attending and welcome to the webinar on key strategies to secure funding for matching grants and major projects. Today's webinar will be recorded and everyone attending today can get a copy of the recording after the webinar is over. I'll be watching for questions that come through the chat and there will be time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. And now I would like to introduce Bethany Quinn, Vice President of Strategy and Content Development for Golden Shovel Agency, and Brian Apernathy, the General Manager of Convergent Nonprofit Solutions an organization who has helped economic development organizations and chamber of commerce to raise millions of dollars to fund strategic initiatives and major projects throughout the United States. Thanks, Brady. I think uh, I'll jump in real quick here. I, I just have to say there's great relevance uh, on the timing of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, just over the past week at Convergent, we've seen uh, opportunities come up with two organizations in different parts of the country that have significant capital projects where they have secured uh, public sector grants to cover a significant uh, portion of that funding, uh, but have a gap they need to close where they're going to be approaching the private sector to step up and uh, and get them across the finish line. So uh, more and more over the past uh, year, year and a half, we're seeing opportunities like this uh, emerge in communities across the country, and the uh, the pace of those opportunities is only increasing. Thank you, Brian. That's absolutely true. Uh, we are seeing that on the Golden Shovel side every week. We're having these types of conversations, and that's why we really wanted to invite Convergent to present to all of you today, because we know there's opportunities out there opportunities that you are actively seeking, but may need assistance to get it over the finish line. And so that's what it comes down to is grants are available, but what do you really need for your community? What do you wanna go after first? It's important to start by identifying what your needs are and create a fundraising plan. And that's where grants can come in, but grants very often require that match. So. Convergent, what do you say to that? Yeah, matching opportunities are fantastic starting points to go out and raise additional funding uh, from other local private sector sources. Uh, and we do this with nonprofits of all types across the country. Uh, primarily, a biggest uh, area of our work is community and economic development. Uh, and there are ample opportunities to use grant funds, as we'll see some examples today, uh, either to maybe complete a critical project or catalyze investment and change in a community that uh, might not have been able to get started otherwise. So that's what people are really trying to do is leverage grant funds to their maximum capacity. And, and I think that's something that's really interesting in, in my conversations with Brian and the Convergent team is the fact that, that that match can very often be pivotal on both ends, sometimes at the beginning of the project, sometimes at the end. And I'm really excited for them to share examples with you today of how that actually plays out. And just as an example of why it is necessary to look at multiple and diverse funding sources are some of the infrastructure grants that are available. For example, the Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program, that can be used for construction, for improving a project or property, for healthcare facilities, for example. And we know that especially in rural communities, healthcare is a big challenge and those facility investments are very often necessary but also with education, with utility services and local food systems. But the very most that that grant will fund is 75% of the project. On the low end, it's 35. So you can't do it with a grant alone. And uh, the opportunity for collaboration in this is particularly relevant when it when we look at how to expand opportunity for an organization and leverage those grants. So a great example here uh, in the, uh, the YMCA domain, uh, current client of Convergence, uh, YMCA that had grown significantly uh, was beyond exceeding the capacity of their current facility. Uh, and in their community, there was a significant population of uh, senior citizens, retirees, and there was a state grant that was focused on providing additional services to serve that population. So the Y has been able to leverage that state grant 
to fund a significant portion, two thirds of a capital expansion that's going to allow them to serve the intent of the grant, but also significantly expand their ability to do the rest of the work that they're doing in their community under the normal YMCA mission. So Convergent is working with them to fund a private or to implement, I'm sorry, a private sector campaign that will fund the remaining third of the capital needed uh, to complete that project. Uh, and the, the area of use that's going to be leveraged for that specific grant uh, is a small piece of the footprint, a small number of hours a week. So they're leveraging this local opportunity for, for state grant funding and accomplishing so much more in their community than if they were just doing that one piece of work. I think that's a really good point that you make, Brian, is sometimes we go after grants and obviously there's a very narrow focus with them, but that doesn't mean that the improvements made using those grant funds can't also benefit the rest of your work. Great example. All right, so like we said, a match is typically required. Uh, we have examples, for example, one of our clients in Gallup, New Mexico, they have an incredible workforce development program that we've been so happy to share. They realized that there was a huge gap in people who had the skills to actually work in the construction trades. And one of the barriers to entry that they saw was getting students plugged in with employers early on. So that way they were taking what they were learning in the classroom, even though of course that's very hands-on training, but being able to apply it immediately. So they weren't just graduating from the program, getting a certificate and then having to look for work, but they graduated with that built-in training and experience. So their program has been incredibly successful and they've been able to help a lot of people go through it. And then of course, uh, bolster their construction industry in the process. But they received an EDA grant to assist with this project. And the EDA typically requires at least a 20% match. So again, great examples of what you can do. Just the grant has to be one aspect of the funding process, not the entire thing. And oftentimes a grant can be one piece of a funding process that can come in various stages. Uh, a great example here, uh, Good Samaritan Health Center uh, outside of Atlanta anticipated an opportunity to secure a community development block grant, which is uh, HUD funding, uh, locally administered. There are specific stipulations around these grants. Uh, they're uh, a little bit cumbersome to complete the application for, but they are immediately available capital and they have a horizon for utilization. So that those dollars have got to be spent within a defined period of time. Good Samaritan stepped into a focused private sector capital campaign and secured the additional funding so that when that community development block grant was awarded and they did get those capital dollars, they were able to immediately initiate their prospect or their project with no concerns of gap in other funding uh, and leverage those community development block grant funds. And ultimately, because they were able to execute so quickly, they actually received additional funds that other organizations were not prepared to leverage in the defined horizon. So planning in advance to leverage these grant opportunities can be a significant, significant factor when it comes to overall awards. That's fantastic, Brian. That's something that most people probably aren't aware of is that you're able to go after additional funding if you use yours up quickly. That's great insight. That's right, and can be a great uh, cover the gap with uh, construction costs, so many things, uh, fees varying these days, having that little extra margin can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see here that they were actually operational in 10 months. So regardless of whether or not a grant was used, that's a fantastic timeline. They very clearly had their planning done ahead of time. That's right. So you can raise the match first. Brian actually just told you all about that. Um, here's another example, though. So in Pierce County, Nebraska, they've done a fantastic job in their county of really leveraging the opportunities that come their way. Uh, this is a rural community. And so they've gotten creative. And one of the things that they were able to do is use grant funds to help build more housing in their community. Uh, they already had some money in place that was able to be used for 
the match, which was 50% of the project. And that's one of the ways that they were able to actually access these funds and put them to work right away. One of the things that I, I love about their story is that when they were able to get a developer to come in and build these housing units for workforce, because the grant was leveraged to make the deal more financially attractive, that developer was really appreciative and actually went on to do more projects that didn't have any grant funds at all. So sometimes this can be a great marketing tool and a tactic to attract business and, and development to your community uh, that really helps to get the ball rolling with some of your initiatives. And workforce is, uh, is an important area to think about here uh, on many fronts. Uh, Sumter County, Georgia, which is a rural county in South Georgia, uh, was seeing what many rural counties uh, are experiencing, which is where population is uh, shifting. There's a constriction of workforce. Uh, and while immediate workforce solutions are helpful, looking towards that future workforce development creates uh, some significant opportunity to pursue grant funding as well. The One Sumter Economic Development Foundation uh, prepared an application to launch a college and career academy to expand opportunity for local students. Uh, in doing so, knowing that ultimately a match would be required, they went ahead and engaged local supporters, businesses, individuals, to gain letters of support uh, and pledges for financial investment in the project if the grants were awarded. So not required, but they went above and beyond to have all of that organized in advance. Uh, and within a couple of years, they received that grant, were able to launch a college and career academy uh, and mitigate this risk of wondering whether or not they would be able to match the stipulated local funding after they received the grant. Yeah, and I think it's really powerful to be able to approach your business leaders, especially if it is a workforce development initiative. So we are, again, we're seeing that on the golden shovel side that some of the most successful organizations are the ones who are able to reach into that network of businesses and community leaders who are also going to benefit from these same things, uh, especially if you're talking about workforce development. These are immediate needs that they have. So approaching your business leaders, asking exactly the type of training and development and workforce pipeline they're hoping to get. And then telling them that you have grant opportunities, but you might need their help to, you know, really secure that grant funding is not a hard ask. Not and at all. if you haven't approached them yet, we are seeing again so much success. Uh, so is Brian and the Convergent team. So I would definitely recommend you have those conversations. We have so many examples for you guys. Um, we did want to bring up one that talks about what happens in the very beginning at the planning phase. So One East Kentucky is a client of ours, a fantastic organization. They represent nine different counties. And one of the things they're working on right now is how do we revitalize our downtowns? They're charming, but there's not enough business activity happening there. And we want to spur economic growth in this way. So they were able to leverage a grant from Kentucky Power to secure help from Retail Strategies, which is a consulting firm many of you are familiar with, to help identify ways that they really could revitalize those downtown activities. Now, after the strategy is complete, they'll have to go to the next phase to figure out what grant funds and private investment dollars are available to help implement those activities. So sometimes what's interesting is that you can go ahead and secure a grant for the planning phase, but you have to keep in mind what's going to happen next. And this is where I really like to have the feedback of Brian um, from the Convergent side, because I know you've seen it work both ways. Do you have a recommendation or best practice to have money lined up first or to complete the strategy and then go for it? There are absolutely pros and cons to both leveraging whatever your nearest opportunity is, is oftentimes the best way to get things started. And we'll have uh, a couple of different angles you could take here. Um, number one, looking towards those capacity building grant opportunities can be significant. Oftentimes, and the market is changing so much even today, but especially over the past three, four years, uh, the, uh, the old way of doing things is, uh, is becoming less relevant. So innovating, changing approaches to uh, uh, issues that maybe we've addressed or been focused on in the past that are just different today 
uh, can be difficult with a confined set of operational resources. So looking to grants to catalyze a new way of thinking, a new strategic plan, uh, starting in that sense can be very, very helpful. Because if you plan in a collaborative manner, you're going to be sowing seeds of excitement with other key stakeholders that are going to start to see themselves in this new vision and this new way of doing things and start to see the benefit. Uh, and then they're going to want to help fund making it happen soon. Uh, from there, one of the other things you can do is get all the way through uh, your grant process. And a great example we've got uh, on the next slide is from uh, Valdosta, Georgia. Um, this is, again, a South Georgia uh, rural community. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead one on you there, Bethany, but I'll finish up. Uh, Keep going, no worries. Um, wanted to look at uh, expanding innovation through an EDA grant, which we mentioned those before, uh, to do a entrepreneurship uh, incubator. They prepped everything for the grant, had it submitted, and then as many of you may know, that's just a waiting game. Uh, but they went ahead with the planning. They started having those conversations, uh, putting together pro formas, uh, conducting a feasibility analysis to gauge potential private sector support uh, and catalyze some of those conversations so that when the timing of the grant award would come, they would have the ducks in a row and ready to just move forward quickly uh, and execute and also course correct if needed based on the feedback they received in those uh, community conversations. Well, I think it's also great for people on this on this webinar to know that EDA grants can be used for an incubator project. Uh, we are hearing a lot of feedback that, you know, supporting again, entrepreneurial activity is so important for many economic developers. How to fund it is often a mystery. So this is a great example. Uh, going back one, here we go. Um, again, I talked about Pierce County, but they're just a shining example. So I'm going to use them again. So they have done amazing job of getting businesses to open up in their downtown space. Uh, we were speaking about that just a minute ago, how in Eastern Kentucky, they're working very hard on doing the same thing. So in Pierce County, they leverage some various grant funds to help businesses open. And um, those grant funds came through a tax mechanism they had with the LB840 program and also through the USDA. But they are offering business planning support to entrepreneurs, and very often they are working to augment what a local bank can do so that entrepreneurs can open their doors. Now, for a rural community, when I say they're doing a great job, they've opened over 55 new businesses in just the past couple of years, creating spaces downtown that are completely full. That's phenomenal. Um, 55 new businesses in any downtown area, even if you're a mid-sized city, is a really big deal. But for a rural community, even more so because there are additional challenges that exist. So this is a great example of, again, how you can leverage grant funds like from the USDA. But if you were able to bring in some of your large employers, uh, maybe your healthcare, um, hospital networks, things of that nature, you can raise even more funds to help small businesses start. And then of course that enhances the entire ecosystem and the quality of life in the community. Quality of life, there you go. Okay, this is all you, Brian. Yeah, quality of life has become a critical factor to consider in economic and community development with, again, we've mentioned workforce, but with population uh, shift uh, around metro areas, rural areas, the quality of life amenities a community has can become critical factors in winning big projects and sustaining economic vitality. So organizations like the Four Rivers uh, Arts Center in Paducah, Kentucky is a great example. This is a cornerstone arts facility that uh, several years ago had a concern about their long-term sustainability and stability in the community, leveraged a significant two-to-one matching grant uh, to catalyze investment in their endowment, providing a long-term stable runway uh, for the value they're delivering and quality of life in that community. And this is a great example because they leverage non-traditional funding avenues to maximize the capacity of this grant. So planned giving, uh, life insurance gifts even to uh, leverage what someone may be able to give today or invest today 
to maximize the long-term value at some point in the future. Uh, so thinking creatively about sustainability of communities is very, very critical when you're starting to look at grant opportunities that can be leveraged as a match. Many organizations get very excited about knowing that their investment can set the foundation for a legacy and then going out to match that gift helps all of the other individuals, businesses, organizations that may step in, uh, think creatively as well and look towards some of those, uh, in this case, non-traditional uh, giving pathways to really maximize investment and know that what is being accomplished will legitimately be around for generations to come, continuing to benefit the community. So Brian, I didn't prep you for this, um, but I'm going to throw some questions at you before we go on. Endowments, that is not a word that you hear tossed around very much in economic development or chamber circles. Can you touch on that a little bit more before we move on? Absolutely. And it is starting to come up uh, slowly a little bit more in chamber and economic development discussions. Uh, so this is a phenomenal way to leverage investment to drive sustainability, right? We're, we're familiar with the idea of endowment. We think more about higher education, maybe larger uh, institutional nonprofits like hospitals, but building an endowment that is focused on, uh, say, ensuring site development, seed funding is available for years to come, right? Finding the investors with capacity and interest in these areas that can see a pathway to longevity of impact uh, is not a difficult sell, and it is a great point to go out and leverage match to set up a perspective for sustainability. If there is anything uh, we learned from 2020, it was that things can change very quickly and significantly, and many more organizations are thinking today about this endowment mindset. Another great tidbit here, uh, the coming generational wealth transfer uh, in the United States, uh, and this is particularly wealth of baby boomers that will be handed down generationally, is estimated to be in some cases above $70 billion, I'm sorry, trillion dollars. So uh, this is more than twice uh, the national debt as a reference point, thinking about the resources that will be changing hands in the years ahead. So thinking towards endowments, thinking towards planned giving and non-traditional avenues. Uh, that's just non-cash transfer of funding and investment in community projects. Now is the time to start to think about how to approach securing funding in avenues such as an endowment. Yeah. So again, that's super interesting. I think you, you know, your example even with how do we continue to invest in site development. That's a big challenge, right? I mean, you you go ahead, you develop some sites, you market them for a couple of years. It does take a couple of years to actually bring business in. And then the community looks at you and says, well, who are you going to bring in now? And the economic developer says, well, we have a problem. I don't actually have a site to bring in anything significant. So we need to go back to the drawing board. And this is a cycle that happens over and over again. The challenge with that is it can slow down momentum. So an endowment, wow, what a great idea. What a creative idea to actually address that. Now, again, putting you on the spot, but if someone wants to set up an endowment, who should they reach out to first? Is that you guys? Is that an attorney? What do you recommend? So what I would recommend is to consider a feasibility study to validate that uh, the value proposition of what that endowment would provide and the funders that would seed it, as well as others who may want to uh, participate in a match or, or whatever the structure might be. Uh, you want to make sure there's water in the pool before you get up on the jumping board or, or the diving board. So um, a feasibility study is a great means of testing that. Uh, and then from there, there are numerous structures you can pursue to actually form the endowment. Local community foundations are uh, typically great options that can house those funds. Uh, you can form your own legal entity uh, for a foundation or a, uh, an endowment that is a 501c3, can receive funds directly. Uh, and then there are some other organizations out there uh, that similar to community foundations would help you host manage that funding uh, and receive those uh, non-traditional gifts as well. And you guys do the feasibility studies, right? So you could probably make recommendations in that report as far as who could do that locally. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. We would do that. And we've got a few strategic partners across the country that actually assist in managing and setting up those uh, endowment funds as well. Perfect. Well, thank you for exploring that more with me. I hope everyone listening got some value out of that, because again, I know that's a very new and unique approach to economic development funding. Uh, one of the things we wanted to touch on today is, again, some child care grants. These are just more examples of how there's a very urgent need, child care throughout the country. And there's so many mechanisms to fund this. And, and matching grants are obviously one of them. In Illinois, for example, there is a grant that can help to pay for expansion, but you have to match at 10%. 10% uh, might not be a big deal, but it might be a big deal to the actual provider. They might not have any extra money to go ahead and expand. I think sometimes as economic developers and people in this industry, uh, we look at what we can do for our projects, but it's also important to think through what could we actually do to help the businesses who already exist to grow. And if you have, say, a childcare facility that wants to expand and you know that there's a matching grant, that's something that you could probably help to step in and raise money for. Um, Brian, how would you approach that from a funding perspective? Strategically looking at the opportunities that are there and lining up the process based on the specific grant stipulations is always an important thing to consider. Uh, timing and, and process uh, in grant applications can make or break uh, the entire uh, opportunity. So uh, knowing if you need to get other partners lined up outside, um, really paying attention to the details beyond just the deadlines is uh, is a crucial step uh, that can't be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of deadlines, I highlighted this on purpose for any of our Texas partners that are here on the call today. Uh, no, the November 30th is the new deadline, if you didn't see that, for the Texas Child Care Grant, if you're actually applying as part of an employee partnership program. So it has closed to individual providers, but of course, a lot of employers are looking at ways to provide child care. There is still, I guess, this month to go ahead and put that application in. Uh, here's another example. Nebraska, they're doing the same thing. They're they're giving out money to help child care centers start or expand. But again, $10,000 is a great start. That's not going to cover it entirely. So it is very important that as economic development community, we look at, okay, what is the actual need and how can we help to fund the remaining need? And in, in economic development, child care is becoming, uh, many of us may be totally aware of this, it is becoming a critical issue. I cannot tell you the level of frequency that child care comes up with our chamber and economic developments uh, clients across the country. Two, three years ago, never would have expected to be having conversations about daycare facilities in an economic development boardroom, but it is very, very normal today. Uh, and innovative approaches to solving that are critical to addressing the need. And employers are feeling it, and employers are willing and eager to fund solutions uh, that are anything other than them opening their own daycare because they know that's not the business they want to be in. True. Good point. Uh, and that's actually why I wanted to include this slide, talk about creative ways to encourage expansion of child care facilities. So, San Luis Obispo, so that's just one town, one city in California. And they decided that they were going to do something themselves to help resolve this problem. And they invested $108,000 so far in childcare startups and expansion. And they've been able to create 112 new spots within their community, which is which is fantastic, truly. So when you look at this money and how much you have to invest at the beginning, uh, it might seem high to say, okay, we're going to be investing maybe around 9000 per spot, but think about the long-term benefits of that. As long as the facility stays open, those are spots that are going to continue to be used by children. And of course, that's people back in the workforce, potentially 112 more people back in the workforce. And again, any community could do that. That could be the type of initiative that you decide to raise money for within your local investors and community. And of course, if you're in a state where you can get some uh, grant funds, that can be applied as well, which would then reduce how much you have to give to each provider to either start or expand. 
Other cities are looking at this as well. Uh, Juno is just one more example where they're looking at starting their own grant fund that they can use in combination with state funds for childcare. Have you seen any other creative ideas you want to throw out there, Brian? I know it's in all the conversations right now. So I uh, have actually just recently been at several uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of America conferences, uh, their leadership conferences across the country, and the frequency uh, with which developers are thinking about child care is increasing. Uh, talked with a Boys and Girls Club executive uh, at the Pacific Conference who had a developer that had come to him and said, we want to develop a multi-use, uh, mixed-use facility. There'll be some residential, there'll be some retail. Uh, and one thing that developer knew was critical was a child care solution. Uh, and he approached the Boys and Girls Club and said, would you put a facility here? Uh, and now they've got that in-house solution. So lots of creative avenues. Uh, I know some communities uh, near where I live outside of Atlanta uh, where they've taken a similar approach of going into uh, these housing communities and, and setting up localized in-home child care programs just to provide after school support so those working parents don't have to wonder about how their kids uh, have access to safety, homework support, all that, but also so that they can continue to work. And the economic ripple effect uh, of these parents being able to continue to work while their kids are in a safe a uh, reliable place for childcare can't be overlooked. Uh, when you look at just this reality, 108,000 uh, to provide childcare uh, and 14 grants, 112 new slots. Think about the number of parents who are able to continue to work and earn and then spend because of those childcare slots. So I would uh, venture to say that the return on that 108,000 invested is significant in terms of the local economic impact, uh, not just this year, but next year and the year mm -hmm. after and the year to follow. So there is a great ROI to be had for local employers of all kinds, businesses of all kinds, uh, when this access to childcare uh, is available because it is building the workforce and that's expanding the economic capacity of the community. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. And, and that's why it is such a priority that you said one thing that I want to, again, put me on the spot, explore a little bit before we move on, because I know it's something that's unique in my mind to what Convergent does. You talked about the ripple effect. And it doesn't matter with childcare. I know you're looking at that with everything. So can you talk a little bit about why that's important when you're trying to raise money? Absolutely. So more and more funders are looking strategically at what is the long-term outcome of the dollars that are being invested particularly in community and economic development, where the largest pool of funders is often corporations or corporate foundations, a very business-minded approach to funding decisions comes along with that. Uh, so at Convergent, uh, we, we approach fundraising through what we call the investment-driven model, where we are looking at the economic impact of the outcomes an organization delivers. So I'll use the uh, a Boys and Girls Club as an example based on uh, the, the conversation around childcare. When a parent is able to continue to work and earn a wage and spend, uh, they're going to spend more money on retail at a grocery store. They're going to spend more money on food at a restaurant. Uh, they're going to deposit more dollars in a local bank. Uh, so you've now just showed three business owners direct value for their investment in what your organization, a Boys and Girls Club in this case, is doing. That's not even to get into the long-term economic impact of lifetime earning potential that a student is going to have when they have had access to these additional supports outside of the school day. Uh, so we approach fundraising through this lens. We model out this economic impact in every campaign that we manage. Uh, and it very much changes the conversation when you go to a car dealer or a construction firm and say, we're asking you to give to this versus we're asking you to invest in a program that is going to drive economic benefit that your business will benefit from. And here is the modeled out economic perspective of what that means for each sector in the community. When you tell the construction guy he's gonna build more buildings or the car dealer he's gonna sell more cars, you've just made this a much easier business decision to support the work that you're trying to fund. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in this case, of course, we're talking about child care, which helps people immediately get back in the workforce. But the same thing applies with workforce development initiatives. I mean, if you are giving people the skills to where they don't have to be, say, in a service profession that is very low wage, can actually go into something like manufacturing or get a certificate and go into healthcare, what have you, they're bringing so much more money into the community. And that becomes a powerful conversation, um, which I find very interesting because I think a lot of times when people ask for money, they don't ever make that claim. This is, this is you give me money it's going to help you and improve your life. So that's a very interesting approach. The workforce is another great example there. Um, em employers don't love paying overtime, right? That's a uh, increased cost that we have seen firsthand. They would much rather invest in a solution that's going to build and prepare a long-term workforce for their business than just continue to pay overtime because they can't fill uh, the roles that they need. Oh, absolutely. You know, and if you have a lot of employers that are suffering with from that, I mean, they're going to have those numbers. They're going to know how much extra they're spending. So what you're asking for investment may actually be a fraction of that additional expense. Very good point. All right. Infrastructure. Uh, this is actually a great uh, transition from our last conversation. Securing investment that solves a shared pain point it's so much easier than help me fund this thing that may not impact you very much, right? So we talk about that with workforce. Um, another great example here from one Sumter uh, down in Americus, Georgia, uh, broadband in rural communities, again, coming out of the pandemic, uh, we saw the importance of being able to remain connected digitally. Uh, one Sumter, which was formed and is funded by private sector local dollars, uh, identified, pursued, and was awarded a $25 million state grant to expand broadband access uh, there in America's Sumter County. So uh, as you can see here from the details, this was a significant project, $33 million in investment, 488 miles of service area expanded, uh, $25 million from the state, a million from the local county, uh, one Sumter themselves put some money in the pot and then Pineland Communications that went in uh, and provided that broadband service, uh, provided the additional. So years before this grant was even on anyone's radar, the community came together and chose to fund an organization that would focus on identifying and leveraging grants just like this to provide the sustainability and growth that they knew their community would need. So a uh, very, very strategic long-term perspective on ensuring that this community was able to secure grants uh, like the College and Career Academy we mentioned earlier, as well as this broadband expansion that every community in Georgia was competing for. So uh, really, really strategic value that came to roost here on this one. That's a really interesting example, being able to actually fund someone who is going to be responsible for finding these grants and, and obviously pulling the materials together before the grant opportunity becomes available. Uh, you're right, very long-term approach, but clearly it's paid off dividends for one Sumter. That's great. All right, Brian, we've talked about so much, but I know you have more to share. So what'd you leave out? So... Uh First thing to do with grant opportunities is understand the opportunities that are out there, right? It can feel a little bit daunting to, to think about, let's go get some grant funds, but not really know where to start. So uh, searching through local, state, federal databases, uh, some of the types of grants we mentioned are great places to start. Um, and then, of course, there are fundraising and grant professionals out there that can help you do recon uh, identify opportunities uh, and put those all into order to develop a proposal schedule. Um, the next thing you really need to do is consider your administrative capacity. Some grants are very, very daunting to complete. I mentioned community development block grants earlier, uh, lots of red tape, uh, paperwork, and so forth, but they are significant opportunities. So think about the administrative cost Look at whether or not grants provide funding to underwrite that administrative cost. In some cases, uh, you'll be able to fund the administration out of the grant funds themselves. Uh, and look at the timeframes. 
Uh, as we mentioned before, timelines are really critical. So you want to think your, about your capacity organizationally uh, and whether or not you can keep pace with the timelines on the grants. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's better to wait and get it right than try to rush and maybe miss an opportunity, but set a tone with a potential funder uh, that might stick around in their minds on a next grant cycle. Uh, and then the next piece here is strategy and feasibility. Uh, knowing you've got the right plan of work sometimes can be approached after the grant, right? We talked about capacity building grants, so we'll set those aside a little bit here. But when you start to look at some of these other grant funds that are specific project focused, building, refining, testing a plan for fulfillment of the grant's focus area, knowing that you've got uh, the right perspective, the right order of operations to secure any necessary matching funds, uh, you've got the right community partnership and collaboration. Having all of those things lined up uh, can make the difference, as we've mentioned in a few cases, between a, a winning the grant award uh, and not winning the grant award. Uh, we spotlighted a, a several points where having those details in order uh, was a value to the organization that ultimately uh, was awarded the grant. Uh, and then lastly, think about how you will secure uh, any additional funding that may be needed on those grants, as well as the grant submissions themselves. Uh, many, many community economic development organizations, chambers around the country uh, are feeling the workforce constraints themselves. Uh, so when you're looking at these opportunities, uh, consider how you'll be able to complete submission of those grants, uh, doing the legwork there, uh, or whether or not you need outside support on that front, or with a campaign to fund any potential match. Um, expediency is always a good thing in campaigns. Uh, doing them swiftly, strategically, uh, getting in, getting the funding and throwing a party at the end of the campaign as quickly as possible is always the best route. Uh, otherwise, we've all seen these fundraising efforts that tend to drag on. Uh, and not to mention, as we've noted, there are oftentimes some horizons on these grants that moving quickly is a requirement to be able to get the funds. Yeah, thank you, Brian. That's all really good insight. And you had mentioned earlier, starting with the feasibility study. So do you feel like that's really important to be able to move quickly? It is. And I would say that there is some variation depending on the grant timelines, uh, with that feasibility study, it's a crucial step if you're going to go out and approach uh, other private sector funders locally for a match, uh, but you want that to move quickly to a campaign as well. So looking at your grant timeline and, and based on that award timeline of when you need to submit, uh, what the requirements are, and when any outside private funding might need to be secured, you would want to strategically position your feasibility study so that there's not a significant multi-month or longer gap between the study and any potential private sector funding. Uh, the reason being is you're planting seeds of expectation in that feasibility study, and you don't want folks to see something, get the feeling there's going to be some progress, and then sit still for several months. So uh, if you've got questions in a specific case about that, uh, Convergent, our team would be happy to help uh, guide organizations through that based on the specific scenarios that they're facing. And do you guys, uh, I know we'll get this at the end, but do you guys give out free consultations if someone has a question, say, on endowments or feasibility studies or how to make all this stuff work together? Absolutely. If you've got basic questions of how to line up some of the strategic points here, uh, we're happy to talk with you, uh, work through how it may be best to, uh, to get those in order and what operational dynamics uh, that may need to be in place based on your unique community um, focus area, uh, operating structure, and what have you. So it, there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to feasibility studies and capital campaigns. It's very much custom-tailored. Uh, so if there's questions, we'd be more than happy to help provide some direction on uh, what the next steps may be. Perfect. Yeah, sometimes it helps just to have that conversation and, and really clear the air on some of those lingering questions. Um, Brady... I know you are keeping tabs on any questions. 
these are some thoughts we're going to leave you guys with. But before we do that, um, do you have any questions that people have sent you that you need to ask, Brian? Yep, we do. We have one question from Dan from Nebraska that sent me this question. He asked, what should I do first, raise money for a match or write the grant? First thing I would do is look at the grant stipulation. If it specifies that it should be used for a match, um, then follow through and see if it gives you a timing dynamic. Uh, so without specific details on exactly what the grant award stipulates, uh, I would say uh, it could depend. But if you think you've got a match opportunity and you've got a high sense of confidence in that award, it's a great time to start having those initial conversations with other potential high level funders just to gauge some feedback. If you start to get traction there, then it's probably stop time to start thinking more about a formalized feasibility study, uh, validating how broad that support could be, uh, and making sure that the potential to fully complete that match uh, is out there, especially if it's a stipulation to getting the grant award. Uh, we had one second question then as well. Uh, Julie from South Dakota sent me it right before she had to hop off the call, but how do you convince people and businesses to invest in your vision when inflation is high and people are nervous? So every four years, we have this great reason for folks to have a little bit of uncertainty uh, and slow down their decision making. And every election year uh, in our campaigns, we hear folks say, well, we're just not sure. So a little bit of uncertainty, uh, issues like inflation, when they come up, they're very, very normal in fundraising conversations. So number one, don't be alarmed by that because it's always a plausible excuse. The real way to change their paradigm and get them uh, off of uh, the reluctance to make a decision, uh, as I noted before, is that return on investment perspective to help them see that yes, inflation may be present, will probably always be present, but growing your opportunity for your business to grow uh, and, and expand its position in the local economy uh, is a way to combat that inflation in a sense, right? Growing, even if inflation is growing, is a good thing. No business would want to miss the opportunity to grow. So if you're presenting a vision that is paired with a very rational economic perspective on how it's going to benefit the business or organization that you're talking with from an economic standpoint, it makes that decision much, much easier for that business leader uh, to say, yes, we will absolutely be investing in this because we want the economy to be stronger locally next year and the year after and the year after. And they want that whether inflation is high or there is uh, economic uncertainty. Thanks, Brian. I think that's a really good point, right? Businesses need to grow. I mean, I saw that old adage, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. And you can do a lot to market yourself, but if your community holistically isn't growing, if more money is not being created in the community, your opportunities are limited. So that's a very good point. And we do have more information on grant opportunities that's available through our free white paper. So I encourage all of you to download that. That's available on our website. And I also wanted to share Brian's information. As, as he mentioned, they are available to speak with you. It's not going to cost you anything to give them a call or send an email over and ask some questions. Uh, fantastic resource. Again, Convergence has been a partner of ours for a long time. And we've seen their work in action with our clients, which is uh, one of the reasons we said, hey, you got to come present to more people just because we've seen them raise millions of dollars and therefore uh, enable the economic developers we support to make a greater impact in their community. So thank you for being here with us today, Brian, and for presenting. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Bethany. And thank you all for attending. We hope to see you soon.